So we're going to press on for just a little bit longer. I did have some questions for our speakers, but since we're um, at the witching hour, I thought we would just open it up to the audience. If you guys had any questions for, well, no, I'll, just, I'll, I'll see it. If, if no one has questions, then I'll ask. I'm not shy. No, no, no. You're, actually, your questions from this morning were really great. So that's Absolutely. why I was like, I had faith in the audience. No pressure. No pressure, but. OK, no questions. Great. Um, <laughs> and then I'll start with a, oh, no. We, yes, yes, go ahead. That's a question, but a, a kind of suggestion or an idea. You know, they make these LEDs now that are just paper thin that you can, by connecting any kind of thing to, you can put many images up without having to worry about shadows. or And you can program it so many different ways, including moving as well as still. The shadows are my favorite part. And we had we had this when I was a kid. It was called Light Bright. Yeah. Um, that would be fun. But that's a great idea. And you know, as I said, you know, we're this is very early. Um, this is really just this is a this is a concept. But just a thought, because um, uh, they're making it so much easier uh, to than to put something to put video everywhere. Right, right. I mean, th that's one of the in in historic preservation. That's one of the constant fears um, about modifying buildings. Um, we see it particularly in sustainability. Oh, we can't put a solar panel uh, on the building because there's going to be a much better one next year. Um, and so what I, what I would caution us is to, I don't, I don't want to wait um, until the technology is right. Because um, I think there's, a, there's an incredible excitement about Girard now. It's palpable in Santa Fe. Um, and we have the opportunity to do something uh, in that corridor um, that is that's reversible and I think one of the things that I love about the projection technology is that we are making absolutely zero physical change uh, to an incredibly authentic and important artifact. Okay. You know, I'm just kidding my friend. Yeah. Um, but then make it into a poster board kind of thing. That's the part that really puts me over I don't think Sandro ever would have done more of that, just based on what I know this aesthetics to be. Okay. Right. Um, I'm going to ask Catherine a question so that you. Oh, no, we've got. Oh, good. Yes. And that is also a question. Um, the necktie, I have a question about the necktie. Sure. Was that um, a one off thing, or was there an accessories line that one could buy at one time? So there are quite a few. I think we have seven or eight in our collection, and they were the later versions. There was an earlier um, Indian silk version done as well. And um, I've spoken with uh, Amy Auschman and Herman Miller about this quite a bit, trying to kind of place these. And Herman Miller was known to create gifts for um, employees um, or possibly for salesmen to give away as well. And so um, that's my thought is that, that it was either one of those. Something that Herman Miller created, um, not, not for sale necessarily, but more as a, as a kind of like a, a freebie gift. Corey had a question yeah. back there. Well, not necessarily a question, just to open up the discussion about finishing the mural. I think we were asked, we've been asked a number of times whether we thought the mural should be finished. And I think it's a really difficult question to do. And I think that the, you know, the safe answer is it's beautiful as it is, right? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to add something on that you don't know what will, what it will look like. And I think it's unfinished in a way, but I think he designed it to be finished and unfinished at the same time. That's why you have those blanks. That's why he finished the one portion. And the rest of the grid looks, you know, stunning as it is. And he so many, he has so many examples of grid pattern where there's no need for extra information or speculation or new information added. And to me, like knowing I have good friends that work in projection, it's super problematic based on angles, based on like um, how the graphic translates the light. So to me, those paintings, which I do believe were painted by um, Mr. Neuhart, you know, those, those in of themselves are masterworks, as he was a master painter. So to think that you're going to somehow achieve that is a really, it's a big ask 
in our opinion, uh, as, a, as a family, especially when you look at how that, like the mural that's been finished, the finished aspect, has been taken care of just as is. I mean, it's it hasn't been upkept, you know, and it hasn't been restored even as it is now. So it seems like it seems like a strange thing to try and you know add something to that has a, a committee of people's idea onto what it could be. Other than I mean, there's so many places to project, and there's so many places to add these different you know. I mean, to me. It, it, why aren't we looking for new artists that are working today in Santa Fe to offer a contemporary look at what St. John's doing? You know, not to say that we shouldn't celebrate Gerard, but just to say that there's current artists working here that I'm sure have super interesting ideas about what contemporarily fits in a school like St. John's, which is what they did with Gerard. So I think it's more in the spirit of thinking to think, where are, what, what's contemporarily happening? I appreciate your comments very much. Yeah, oh, gentlemen. Just, just, uh, I already made this comment to Sean, but having grown up here and visiting this space many, many times, I got it purposely left, finished in the state that it's in. And it was in the imagination of the students to fill in the blanks. I thought it was very clever and Maybe there's no saying that goes you know, something like, no one is exempt from talking nonsense, only some of us do it solemnly, so possibly <laughs> under that category. But I always thought, what a visionary Gerard was to have left these blanks so they could be filled in by the imagination of students that passed them over the years. That's what I thought. Beautiful. The, I want some non-mural questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do want to say I do want to I do want to say uh, <coughs> just briefly about the mural. The 240 concepts that uh, well, there's actually about 186, I think, concepts um, that are represented in the symbols that were chosen um, for the spaces that were meant to have um, uh, symbols, and uh, it's a, the, that in itself could be an education. I mean, it fundamentally is. It represents St. John's ideals, but all, and they all came together and created this list of things. Um, and, but it's really interesting to me to start to ask the question of why did these things matter and who did they matter to? The, the one interesting thing that neither of us um, mentioned is that the college originated the concept of the mural, except it was going to be a historical presentation of all the events that happened in Maryland. Um, mm. So I think we can all be thankful that that mural <laughs> was unfinished. And there's actually a debate even at the college um, with the blank spots because uh, some people believe that it was meant to be left blank. Uh, and I'm, I, I don't mean the blank spots as they are now. The blank spots if you fill in all the things that, have, that are on the list. Um, the with diagram with the purple. The diagram the with the purple. Um, those blank spots were, uh, many people, at the, many other people at the college feel like those were meant to be for future inventions and future history and things that were happening as the college went on. And so it's re that there's a real, there could be a really interesting study in what, what does all that mean. So there's a, it's a really juicy project. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ask Catherine a question um, because some of us may have already seen her uh, talking about Gerard on the television screen in a program called Innovation Nation. Um, and so my question for you, and it's, I'm just curious um, whether you can, whether you know or whether you can actually speak about this, does the Henry Ford have any plans for disseminating this Gerard material? Yeah, um, hold this while I do this. Um, yes, so that was an interesting project. We have a, TV show on CBS called Innovation Nation with Mel Rocca. Um, and curators each week will go through a different part of the collection and talk about it. And um, I volunteered to do one on Gerard a couple of years ago. Um, TV is not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little stressful. But um, at the end of the day, my, I really wanted to get that information out there. And this is a kids' TV show. I wanted to bring that. To, so despite my discomfort perhaps doing it, I, re I really thought that it was beneficial to the public to see these things. Um, we are we have a very robust digitization process. Um, we have 80 
maybe 6,000, 90,000 uh, of our objects currently digitized, which is a, a large number, but as I mentioned, 26 million is, it, I don't know if that will ever happen, if it will all be digitized, it would be, um, it would be uh, tough to get that all done. But that said, we are able to prioritize digitization and um, I've made a, an effort continuously um, and keep pushing the Girard material um, as candidates for digitization. And some of that is up on our digital collection. So if you go to our website and search, um, you can find great high resolution images of quite a bit of what I talked about today and more. Um, but it is just a fraction, of, obviously, of the collection as, as a whole. Um, but that is something that we'll be continuing to do. There is conservation work needing to be done, um, rehousing that needs to be done, but all of that is uh, really being pushed to the forefront now with all this rooted interest in Girard. Um, so I think great things are to come. And I'll just ask, a, since no one has their hand up, I'll ask one question of Sean and, and or Rachel. Um, I guess I only knew of this, uh, you know, when I think about St. John's, I think about the mural. We're not asking you another mural question. I'm just um, kidding, ask away. <laughs> no, but I was, I was um, pleasantly surprised to see the furniture um, mm -hmm. because of that, and, and I didn't know that actually there was furniture design. So I'm wondering if you guys can speak to that um, a little bit more, you know, how much of it was produced and, um, you know, what you make of it. That was a... Uh, this project has been, like, it's touched me in my heart um, so deeply because it, I have never um, been in a project where I was able to interact um, with uh, found records like this. Um, something that somebody hadn't already gone through before. But w something kind of miraculous that happened um, was uh, uh, right when we came on to the project, um, Craig and Jennifer, the librarians, um, w were, notif were made aware that there were a bunch of boxes of documentation, 11 boxes of documentation that were related to the history of the college. And nobody really knew what had been put in those boxes or when or anything. And they went through them and I, I got a very excited phone call or I think it was an email uh, being like, we have to talk. and. Um, Lo and behold, they had found the project files. Mm. Now, we don't have a complete set of project files by any stretch of the imagination, um, but there is a fairly extensive documentation that there were supposed to be many desks, many tables, ashtrays, uh, seals. He was, looking for, um, he was looking for a right font for certain things. And um, so we, we have just gone through those things. And literally this past week, um, Jennifer, the, one of the librarians, sent even one of her students into her dorm to take pictures of these desks that had basically, as far as I know, kind of been lost. Like there, Jennifer has one of the uh, one of the desks. Craig has two of the desks. And I walked into the library what ten days ago or something, and we started. And I said, "Oh, do you know anything about these desks or these tables?" And they're like, "You mean like that one?" And it was just kind of incredible. I mean, they knew that they had some of these materials, and they mm -hmm. knew that they had some of the, so the upholstered um, um, chairs and things like that. Um, but they, there hasn't been a curator at the college to be able to collect that information. And one of the beautiful things that's happened as a result of this project is that we, we know a lot of the information now that we didn't. But I will say that there are materials on St. John's list of what they had. St. John had one set of lists and Gerard had another set of lists. And some of those things jive and some of those things don't. And some of the numbered things that are at St. John's or that, uh, that Gerard bills for, we actually have invoices, it's so cool. Um, they don't jive with either list. So we're still trying to sort that out. All this is brand new, <laughs> this has just happened. And St. John's so. is a very unique campus because it was built all at once. Mm. Um, it's not like the, it's not an age-old campus um, where one building happened and the next building happened, and um, there was you know probably a dozen buildings built in the very first phase. Gerard's original contract um, involved six or eight mm. of those buildings, and um, I think the you know Dorms the college the college is just trying to see what what actually happened versus what's in the contract. For instance, at Peterson, um, we have that the absolutely spectacular chandelier in the dining hall. Uh, but his contract specified that he was designed chandeliers for three other spaces. Um, now, we don't have any historic photographs of those rooms that, that have been found to date. That um, show any that, that, Yeah, they're all, they're all shown, you know, not showing the ceiling. Um, so we don't, we don't 
we, Rachel and I, and, uh, don't know um, whether those light fixtures were ever produced. We haven't seen any designs for them. Um, the, 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 his work there was uh, quite extensive, so it really does deserve um, a lot more research. Um, the college is beginning an inventory of, of the furniture, which has been uh, moved around from building to building. A, um, a nice bit of it is in the president's office. Um, <laughs> uh, and so some of those, some of those beautiful um, upholstered chairs are there currently. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is there a maker's mark, a manufacturer? Who, who manufactured this furniture? Come play with me and let's find out. I, there's, uh, there's one chair that's on uh, exhibit, and um, don't tell anybody, but I turned it upside down to see if there was a maker that's mark. That's what you're supposed to um, And I didn't see anything. Huh, uh -huh. Okay. We, and, and I do have a list of the, uh, I don't have a list of who all was invoiced. I have a list of who was invoiced, but we don't know for what. Mm -hmm. right, and there so are, there was a Santa Fe manu a furniture right. manufacturing company and a butcher block. Mm -hmm. The tables are covered, uh, the tables and the desks all have butcher block tops. Mm -hmm. and, and so we know that the butcher block probably came from one place or another mm -hmm. place, but it looks like it was compiled here in town. One of the challenges that we're facing in thinking about the larger building uh, is that Gerard did want to have all the, the dining furniture to be made of butcher block tables, which is not food safe um, uh, in a context like that. So we will have to be changing um, some of those furniture uh, to make it meet current code. Yeah. Any final questions before? Don't let closing? me end on. No, no, no. I'm uh, great. Um, I just wanted to close in, in just kind of pulling things together um, and just saying that, you know, as we've seen from today's various examples, from Johan's unearthing of Gerard's Italian work to Amy Osherman reminding us of Herman Miller's showrooms and other, and other work for Herman Miller, which certainly employed Gerard's architectural muscle to the textiles designed by Catherine and the St. John's College proj project, um, as told to us by Rachel and Sean, and Rachel kind of contextualizing other New Mexican projects. Um, we really see Alexander Gerard's design practice is incredibly multifaceted, um, but I think that we can also say that it's characterized by planning and order, uh, which goes back to his foundations and architecture. In a statement on his work, Gerard began by noting that, quote, every new project presents some version of basic order, end quote. And I think that that's the reason why we're all interested in Gerard, and it's because he doesn't just stop there, right? That would make him kind of boring. Um, it's about what happens next. It's about the grid, the layers, the colors, the folk art, the other. Um, and this is what keeps drawing us back. Also, that Gerard is really a study of contrast that makes him very interesting, right? Is he a collector of um, what was called in the period, quote, exquisite junk, or is he a tastemaker? Does he find value in culture or value in things? And I think the most important for our symposium, and again, because the days were kind of divided in this way, which is it, folk art or modern design? Now, these rhetorical devices are just that. It's food for thought um, so that we can continue contemplating Alexander Gerard as he is an incredibly important and complex figure worthy of our study. And I hope to see everyone this evening so we can continue conversing on our favorite subject. Thank you.